Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions. Motion 10976, setting out a revised business programme for Thursday, and Motion 10975, on stage two of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. If any member objects to these questions being put, please say so now. And can I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions? Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one objects. So the question is that motions 10976 and 10975 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Point of order, Graham Simpson. Morning, officer. I didn't wish to object to the motions, um, but uh, it throws up um, a potential problem. Um, if the amendments are not dealt with tonight uh, and we continue uh, tomorrow morning, um, that uh, could potentially and, and will uh, clash with committee meetings. Now, those of us who have put down amendments uh, clearly take that very seriously. We would want to move those amendments. Um, but people like myself also have committee responsibilities which are as, as important. Um, so I really rise, you'll probably tell me it's not a point of order, um, but it's, uh, it's, it is nevertheless an important point um, and ask what, what your advice is on that. Uh, can I thank you, Mr Simpson. First of all, I can assure you that it is a point of order. <laughs> uh, and not only that, it's, it's a quite an important one, and I'm sure that you're not the only member who will find themselves in this situation. And certainly it's happened many times in the past where members are attending one committee but wish to be present at another to move amendments. And the standing orders do allow members a choice in these circumstances. It's a choice, however. Rule 12.2a on committee substitutes allows another member to attend committees in place of the member. And Rule 9.10.14 says that any member present may move an amendment where the member who lodged it does not do so. So I would thank Mr Simpson for raising that point of order and I hope all the members who find themselves in that situation uh, think about how to proceed should the situation arise. Thank you very much. We now move to the next item of business, which is topical questions. And our first question is from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the effect of the Scottish income tax rate on military personnel. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government's income tax policy means that everyone who earns less than £26,000 will pay less tax than they would for the same income elsewhere in the UK, the lowest rate of tax in the UK. Everyone who earns less than £33,000 will pay less tax in 2018-19 than they did in 2017-18 for a given wage. Yet military personnel who are resident in Scotland for income tax purposes pay income tax at the same rates as all other Scottish taxpayers. The definition of a Scottish taxpayer is determined by UK, not Scottish legislation, and is implemented by Revenue and Customs. We are fully committed to supporting the Armed Forces community. Service provision varies in different parts of the UK and Scotland, continues to be a very attractive place to live, work and do business, with access to many services not available elsewhere in the UK, such as free school meals, personal care, prescriptions and eye tests, and in many cases, university tuition. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The issue here is that the military personnel devote their lives to service and will be posted where that takes them. Those based in Scotland earning over 26,000 will now pay more uh, for those who are based elsewhere in the United Kingdom. That is 70% of men and women uh, in the service in Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, before the decision was taken to raise income tax for those service personnel, was there any discussion, consultation, or engagement with the MOD? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I, I noticed that Alexander Stewart has completely ignored the fact that for those on the lowest wages in the military who earn up to £26,000, they will pay less under our proposals. And perhaps it, would be, perhaps it would be refreshing to see the Tories concerned about lower paid people uh, for once, rather than those on higher incomes. And secondly, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Defence nearly five weeks ago on this issue. Uh, and I've yet to receive a response. The first response that I got was a press release issued by the Secretary of State having a go at the Scottish Government. That's no way to have the dialogue which Alexander Stewart says he's interested in. But if it's the case, if it's the case the Conservatives are genuinely concerned 
about the pay of the armed forces, why have they not lifted the public sector pay cap? That's the easiest way to deal with the question of public sector uh, pay within the armed forces. I've listed all the different ways in which Scotland is an extremely attractive place for armed forces personnel to be in terms of uh, free prescriptions. It's also true to say that on average, council tax in Scotland is around more than £400 less in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK. These are all reasons why, unlike the Conservatives, we want to attract people in the armed forces to come to Scotland. And perhaps we wouldn't have the recruitment crisis and the failure of the UK government to complete its pledge to have 12,500 personnel in Scotland by 2020 if they were to look after the armed forces across the whole of the UK. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am thankful that the UK Government is now going to act uh, and the Defence Secretary, Graham Williamson, has said that he will urgently review the situation after pressure from Scottish Conservative MPs. It is surely good news, Presiding Officer, that the men and women who keep us safe will now face no financial penalty for being based in Scotland. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, will he join me in overwhelmingly welcoming this? Good. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, the letter that I sent to the Secretary of State for Defence said that we were perfectly willing to discuss that. We also made it very clear. We will not countenance any move by the UK government which disadvantages the lower paid, those below 26,000, who should also factor in some of the concerns uh, of Alexander uh, uh, Stewart as well. So we have said we're willing to discuss that. But if he asked a question about parity between uh, armed forces personnel and welcomes what he says is the action, it's not action as I understand it, it's a review, but if there's action to be by the, taken by the UK government, will they take action to protect the interests of the 10,000 or so service personnel elsewhere in the UK who will pay a higher rate than they would do here in Scotland? Are they going to be even handed? We'll wait and see what the review uh, brings out. So I think it's very important that we take the action that we have, we have taken. We've got the fairest tax policy, I believe, the most progressive in the whole of the UK. We are looking after those and the lowest incomes. And we are doing some of the work which the UK government should be doing to attract people to come into the armed forces in the first place, instead of the recruitment crisis. Going back to the, the failure of any Conservative MSP in Scotland to talk about the Bayesian review and to challenge the government, even when many of their English counterparts, even when the wife of one of the Ministry of Defence ministers is challenging the UK government on a closure of a base in her constituency. Not a word from the Conservatives about the base closures that are happening in Scotland. It's the Scottish government that's a friend of the armed forces in Scotland and not the Tory party. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that if we follow the logic of the Conservative argument and make a special case not to increase the tax on some of those higher earners in the armed forces, would it then follow this should prohibit their access to things like free prescriptions and tuition fees already referred to? Or will he, like me, agree that those serving in our armed forces deserve all the benefits of living in Scotland for which we all collectively pay? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I do agree with Christine Graham that the Scottish Government has always been clear in its ambition that income tax should be fair and progressive. I actually think there's substantial support within the armed forces for the same position as well. And also we'll do that while supporting the delivery of vital public services and enabling investment in the economy. We firmly believe that everybody living in Scotland should be treated equally and fairly in the benefits they receive and the contributions they make. And I can I say the people that I talk to in the armed forces in Scotland are very happy in Scotland. <laughs> they wanted to come here, they're happy to be here, and many of them stay here after they finish their services in the armed forces. And Graham Day. Thank you. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that this is utter hypocrisy on the part of the Tories, whose concern for the financial well-being of service personnel is laid bare by their overseeing a £1,000 real terms cut in wages since 2010 and introducing childcare changes which will leave servicemen and women who move within the services or join the armed forces in future £456 a year worse off. Well, I do agree with Graham Day, and I do think the UK government should follow the lead that the Scottish government has taken and match the commitment that we've made in providing a progressive approach to public sector pay, which protects those in the lowest incomes and delivers a fair deal for public sector workers in Scotland. And it's interesting, not a single Conservative MSP or MP in Scotland has called for the UK government to lift the public sector pay cap for our armed forces personnel. Question to Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Scottish Youth Theatre regarding its future. Minister Marie Todd. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government officials met the Scottish Youth Theatre yesterday on Monday the 12th of March to begin looking at immediate options for the theatre to continue operations. The Scottish Youth Theatre is due to meet the Cabinet Secretary for Cult 
Culture, Europe and External Affairs later this week to continue the discussions. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. There is clear support for the theatre with over 37,000 people signing the online petition and former students are preparing to stage a peaceful demonstration in George Square today. Yet the Scottish Youth Theatre has been here before. Four years ago, the Scottish Government had to put together a package to secure the theatre's short-term future. Can the Minister provide details of the rescue package four years ago, outline the possibility of this being awarded again, and say if any consideration is being given to any transitional arrangements to end the current uncertainty? Marie Todd. So I agree there is a great deal of concern around the country and there is a great deal of concern around this chamber for the youth theatre. Everybody recognises the value of the work that they do. I, as an education minister, am absolutely committed to ensuring that our young people have the opportunity to develop their creative side. It is very important for their emotional development. It is very important for their intellectual development. Recognising that though Creative Scotland is legally at arm's length from the Scottish Government and we cannot intervene in their creative decisions. So um, as I've said to you already, the government officials have met uh, yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary will meet with them tomorrow and I am sure that everybody will be working together to find a solution for them. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I appreciate the Minister is perhaps unable this afternoon to provide the details of the grant that was given four years ago from the Scottish Government to the Scottish Youth Theatre, but perhaps you could write to me with the details of that. Um, Creative Scotland and their regular funding announcement has come under significant criticism in recent weeks. The performing arts are in a precarious position as options for support is dwindling, as local authorities come under significant pressure to deliver services, and commercial support for the sector is contracting. The five national performing companies are currently directly supported by government and receive in the region of £23 million a year, while 184 organisations competed for the pot of £33 million of regular funding from Creative Scotland. An argument is being made that the Scottish Youth Theatre should be given a status equal to the national companies. Will the Minister give a commitment to exploring this option? Minister. I'm sure that that will be one of the options explored by the Cabinet Secretary when she meets with the Scottish Youth Theatre tomorrow. Um, certainly, um, uh, th 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 there has, the case has been put for a number of years that that might be a solution going forward and certainly the Cabinet Secretary is likely to explore that with him tomorrow. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I'm pleased to hear that the Cabinet Secretary will certainly explore that as a national theatre. Uh, Janet Archer, the Director of Creative Scotland, uh, made a statement which said that awards are made on merit. Uh, I can't think of any better award to be made rather than the Scottish Youth Theatre for the, the work that they do. Now, I'm concerned that Creative Scotland, under pressure, are now only pursuing other avenues of funding for Scottish Youth Theatre. And I really would like an explanation as to why this was not offered at the outset, given the outstanding contribution of Scottish Youth Theatre. And if I could possibly also find out why, why the Scottish Youth Theatre in 2014 did not receive RFA funding and have not received it now. Marie Todd. As the First Minister indicated at questions last Thursday, the Scottish Government can't dictate which organisations are offered funding by Creative Scotland. It's for Creative Scotland to explain who has been offered what and when. Creative Scotland, as part of its overall funding announcements in January, stated that the other funding routes were available to organisations unsuccessful in regular funding applications. We recognise that the potential closure of the Scottish Youth Theatre is of concern to many people, including right across this chamber. That's why we're exploring all the options available with the theatre and with Creative Scotland. Rachel Hamilton. I am sure that the Minister is deeply concerned about the recent funding decisions made with regards to the Scottish Youth Theatre, which stands to jeopardise the Year of Young People this year. And and it has an objective that includes providing opportunities for young people to express themselves through culture, sport and other activities. How will the Scottish Government ensure that the decisions made with regards to the Scottish Youth Theatre promote and not jeopardise the object objectives and ambitions of the Year of Young People? Yes. 
Absolutely, we are in the year of young people and arts and culture and theatre within that are very, very important to young people in Scotland, very important to the well-being of the young people of our, of our nation, very important, as I said, to the emotional and intellectual development of our young people. We want to make sure that theatre and youth theatre in particular can flourish, not just this year in the Year of Young People, but generally in Scotland. The Scottish Youth Theatre does fantastic work and it is the desire of all members for it to be able to continue to do so. There are absolutely always difficult decisions to be taken about, about funding. And funding for Creative Scotland for, and for culture and the arts generally increased this year in the budget that we've just passed. Many organisations will be getting regular funding that previously didn't get, and we've managed to mitigate the impact of cuts in lottery funding. Difficult decisions just can't be completely escaped, though, but we are absolutely determined to look at all options to protect, if we can, the work that Scottish Youth Theatre does and to support, as far as we can, a healthy, vibrant cultural sector right across Scotland this year, the Year of Young People and beyond. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government is engaging actively at official and Cabinet level uh, on this issue. I, I think it's fairly clear that the Scottish Youth Theatre do understand some of the issues that they faced in relation to the last funding round and the scale of change in terms of governance as well as addressing issues like inclusivity and removing financial barriers to participating in their programmes, those changes have been underway. But it should also be clear to all of us that they'll be unable to complete that, that process of change and improvement unless they have the confidence of a long-term future ahead of them. So does the Minister agree that what's required is not just a stopgap, not just something that lets them stumble on for a few more months, but gives them the sense of clarity that they can continue with their programme of improvement transformation and becoming a better Scottish youth theatre, not just continuing with a Scottish youth theatre. Minister. I agree with much of what Patrick Harvey has said there. The Scottish Youth Theatre themselves have confirmed to Creative Scotland that they're not seeking a reversal of the decision on the RFO application. And I understand that they have um, said publicly that they themselves recognise that the application could have been better. This government absolutely values the importance to Scotland of youth arts provision, which is why we're working with the Scottish Youth Theatre and Creative Scotland to look at all of the options for young people to continue to benefit from what the Scottish Youth Theatre has to offer. And uh, apologies to Ms McAlpine, I'm afraid we've run out of time for any further topical questions on that. Uh, we'll move now to the next item of business.